Don't touch that dial, you'll never find me on the radio Coming to you live from Sound always done, crashing on my life though Death laughs when passing off a right when You'll never find me on the radio You'll never find me on the radio That die, you'll never find me on the radio. Coming to you live from the sound of two hearts beating, they became one. Well, our lips were meeting, our pacing chance for. Chance for fleeting love Seven, six, five, four, three, 
two, one, zero. Hello, everybody, and thank you for joining us. That's right. This is the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast with your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, here on the Exceptional Conservative Network, TECN TV. And I am happy to be here with you again on our regular program. Today is Thursday, the 25th of April, and it is 1 p.m., actually 107. And I'm happy to be here with you guys. It is always good to be with you, and I thank you, each and every single one of you, for being here with me, because you make the difference. You always have made the difference in this program, and so I thank you all for being here with us, because I appreciate you guys. You, you make, you're make you such a wonderful audience, whether you're seeing it live, whether you see it after the fact, uh, whether it's on YouTube or Facebook or social media, uh, I always always am happy to have you around and I always love to see your comments on everything that I do and everything that we cover here because you guys have some really interesting things that you say sometimes. Uh, But I want to go into, a. a, we have a lot of things that I want to go over. Let me start off first of all, of course, I do want to mention that this weekend is the Liberty Weekend. That is April 27th, April 28th. And I will be speaking on April 28th at 2 p.m. And this will be at Binghamton University in the lecture hall. And this is being brought to us by the Binghamton University College of Libertarians and jointly with the Binghamton University College Republicans. And there's going to be a host of people there. It's going to be a great event. You're going to see Larry Sharp. He's with the Libertarian Party. Uh, He ran for governor of New York in 2018. Uh, There's going to be my good friend, Dr. Giovanni Scaringi. He is a councilman for the city of Binghamton. He is a professor over at SUNY Broom College, and he's going to be speaking on the 27th as well. I'm looking forward to both of them. Uh, In terms of my event, I'll be speaking at 2 p.m., and that will be uh, followed by a question and answer period. I look forward to any and every question you have on any and every subject. And I'm going to go into that in a little more detail. Of course, if you can, drop by my friends at the Belmar Pub and as well as the Park Diner. Good food, good drinks in both places. That is not paid. That is, They are my friends. I enjoy their establishments. That's why I'm mentioning it. So there's a lot that's going to be going on. This is going to be a busy weekend. Now, just to let people know, I won't be doing the Saturday broadcast uh, quite the same as I usually do. I'm going to be actually out on the road. Uh, I will be at Binghamton University at uh, the Pipe Dream. I will be covering the event. I'll try and do it as live as possible. I'm not sure if that will be on the TECN network or if that will be on Facebook. Trying to work out the logistics of that. And uh, I'll be speaking with Larry Sharp on Saturday at 3.30 That will probably be on Facebook. And then uh, we'll have a live interview with him, having a live conversation. It should be a very good and interesting conversation there, as well as I hope to get some of the other speakers at the event speaking with us and covering that live for you as well. By the way, if you can, please do help us in this endeavor. The cost of traveling to going to these events, recording it, getting that out to you, It's a high expense, uh, as well as keeping the lights on every day. So if you can donate, donate a dollar, five dollars, fifteen, fifty, whatever it is that you can afford, it helps us a lot, especially for like this event uh, where we're just trying to put together some fun so that we can get the best recording possible, making it live for you and getting it out there. Now, speaking of this event, by the way, I did want to mention, I want to give a shout out and a thanks to the Pipe Dream. Uh, That's the Binghamton University College newspaper. And in particular, I want to thank Sheila Kirsch. I believe her last name is uh, pronounced Kirsch. Uh, She did an interview with me for this article, uh, which appeared today on the Pipe Dream. uh, Campus Republicans, Libertarians, to host, quote, Liberty Weekend. Uh, Groups invite political speakers to address personal liberty. And that's the uh, article in the Pipe Dream. 
And the article features, uh, for most of it, and my interview and some of that, my comments that I made about, uh, well, the different aspects of what's going to be spoken about, red flags, first, second, uh, fourth, fifth, fifteenth amendments, the consequences of that, the impact of how it's going to affect families, children, suicide, uh, which covers a wide range of things. And that's the honest fact is almost every single time that we see politicians put out a law, uh, think of Obamacare as an example. It never is just one thing. Look at the Green New Deal. It always has ramifications on other parts of our lives. It is never as simple as, well, it's just going to take care of that. It never does. It always has other impacts. And many of these laws are built around the idea that they're supposed to affect other things. They're not just going to try. And we're always promised it's going to make everything fine. You're going to be fine. You'll be safer than ever before. You'll have free medication. You'll never get sick again. You won't have any debt. You don't have to work hard. We get promised all these kinds of things. And yet, that never happens. And there's always complications. There are always other aspects that happen as a result of these laws. That's true with the red flag laws, just like it was true of Obamacare. It's the same thing as what we're seeing with the Green New Deal, which requires you to join a union that gets rid of planes, that uh, requires that every house has to be changed, whether you want it to or not. 76 million housings in the United States would have to change whether you want them to or not, or be destroyed because Green New Deal you know, th these are the things that you don't hear about, the complications you don't hear about. Like when Obamacare got passed, uh, excuse me, uh, when the Ob Obama stimulus got passed, uh, 344,000 people lost food stamps because of it, because the politicians didn't think it through, because these are the consequences of what they're doing. Um, remember in Obamacare, you were promised for years that you would be able to keep your doctor except they knew for a fact and was then reported in 2013, 2014, that you can't keep your doctor. And millions of people lost their doctors because it's a consequence of the law. Same thing with the red flag legislation. But the thing that really, really uh, stands out in the article, and the thing I want to emphasize here, and it's in the final paragraph of the interview, and it was a great question about what perspective that I would love to see students take from this event. And my answer to her is very simply, and I'm a bit gregarious, but it says, uh, these issues will affect you, students, public, everyone, um, and your children, whether you are active or passive about government. Considering the long-term implications on issues and subjects all the featured speakers will be addressing, I hope students will take the opportunity to become better informed with a more diverse understanding. That is critical. That is critical, and that is the thing I want people to take away from this. Whether you are involved in politics, whether you're an advocate, whether you're just a voter, whether you do or do not vote, it will affect you. And when people tell you your vote doesn't matter, it affects you even more. Because even if you don't agree with something, or even if you do, you have no impact. You're no longer part of the conversation. You're not part of the equation. You may have the best answer in the universe to address taxes, or to solve gun violence, or to, um, I don't know, uh, income equality, whatever, the, whatever it may be. You may have it. You may have that answer. And if you tell no one, if you don't voice yourself, if you don't make the vote, then it will never happen. No politician pays attention to you. They don't care. They only care about those who are voting and those who are donating. That is a fact of elections. Elections at this point are based on who's voting and who's donating. Those are the people who matter. Three out of 10 voters. One of them is making donations big, one is making small donations, and the third is just regular voters who don't donate at all. Those are the three out of 10 people that in America 
that politicians pay attention to. And seven out of 10 people who don't vote don't count. That's just a fact. That's just a fact. And we should change that. We need to change that. Whether you're a conservative like myself, whether you're a Republican like myself, or you're a libertarian, you're a conservative, you're a Democrat, you're a progressive, whatever, wherever you lie on the spectrum, if you're not involved, you don't count. If you don't vote, you don't count. So let's change that and be involved. Show up to the Liberty uh, Weekend. It's, it's free. It's open to the public. I've invited several members of the media. I was on the air today on WMBF talking about it. Um, please, come on out. Ask your questions. Get a different point of view besides what the mainstream media puts out there. You may be surprised by the answers you get. You might be. Then again, you might not. I don't know. But it's worth a try because it will affect you no matter what. So I did want to get that out there and talk about that. Uh, let me also... Whoops, there we go. Uh, obviously, there is a lot of news that's going on today. And I'm pretty sure everyone has heard by now about the news flash, but... News flash. News flash. I do like my sound effects. All right. News flash. Joe Biden is the latest of the 2020 hopefuls for the presidential race of 2000, uh, 2020. And uh, so he's the... He's been the Democratic leader along with Bernie Sanders. They're, depending on the poll you're looking at, on depending on the day, they're pretty much neck and neck. Um, they are leading the entire, now there's 19 officially declared candidates. There's 33 undeclared candidates in the Democratic Party, all vying to become the nominee. And Joe Biden well, I'm going to get into Joe Biden after the break a lot more in detail because he's got issues. That man has lots of issues. And if this is what's leading the Democratic Party, it's kind of scary. And I'll get into that in a little more detail. But talking about the 2020 race, and I want to highlight, first of all, one of the things that we're seeing. Because we saw Joe Biden come out with his announcement today, of course, he is leading, and I'm using Predict It. You can use a lot of different polls and systems, but I just like this. It, it's giving us an idea of where people are willing to put their money and to see how they're feeling about this on any given day. And every day it's changing. But what we see is Joe Biden right now is above Bernie Sanders, which is pretty much reflected in most of the polling at this moment. It does change, but they are basically the leaders. Way down below that, you see that there's uh, Mayor Pete Budigig, uh, who is basically a one-issue, one-gimmick candidate. He's gay. What else? He's gay. That's it. That's his big thing. He is gay. Uh, you've got Kamala Harris, whose big thing is she's a woman of color. That's her big thing. Uh, you've got Elizabeth Warren, who is supposedly a woman of color, according to her belief, one one thousand twenty fourth American Indian, about the same amount as I am Samoan. And she's still hanging in there, right there with Andrew Yang, the man who wants to give everyone money, but not quite. And of course, Beto O'Rourke, the fake Hispanic, a man who's afraid of mentioning that he is white. And we've got Cory Booker trailing behind that um, with no real impact. But they've got some news out today. So let's actually talk about where are these people see I, I find it interesting and not everyone is willing to talk about this that the candidates in the 2020 election they're pretty useless on the democratic side i mean they're not talking about issues they're talking all of the candidates are following bernie sanders they're pushing to the left to the farthest fringe of the left to the political leaders of tomorrow or plot they're pushing towards Black Lives Matters and Antifa and the fringe far left. And we see this over and over again. And they keep promising things. And that's the thing that scares me. Because they keep promising. They're going to give you something. You've got something. We've, we're going to give you something. Case in point, what's the big news from Elizabeth Warren? She's proposing to give $640 billion 
to students uh, to eliminate student debt. Now, that's kind of interesting. And I know there's a lot of young people who are thinking, well, that'd be great. I want to get rid of that. And it's actually going to cost $1.5 trillion. Not $640 million. It will cost $1.5 trillion. Now, you got to ask yourself, where does that money go? By the way, the government owns the student loans. And student loans have increased since the government took it over in 2010. That's something that Maxine Waters didn't know and had to be told. Uh, as she was trying to demonize the banks for the banks having all this. It's not big banks. The banks don't own the student loans anymore. The government does. And the government can, has continued to own these, making money and raising up the amount of people who owe this. And it's funny because every time Democrats have given more money to student loans and talked about trying to work on the student loans, we've noticed that the debt goes up and the amount of cost of college goes up because, you know, if the government prints money, everyone wants more and colleges charge more. But she's been, Elizabeth Warren comes out there and she's saying, well, I'm going to get rid of that $1.5 trillion, $1 trillion. Where will it go? How do you just wipe out that debt? That money has to come from somewhere and go to somewhere. It doesn't just disappear. Not that everyone is going to get that. But most people who are under $100,000 would get about $50,000 wiped out, which would take care of most of it. She also wants to get rid of the cost for a two-year or a four-year public college. Okay, That's also part of her deal. So she's going to wipe out the debt for private colleges, essentially. And uh, depending on which college you go to, the Ivy Leagues, it would only take care of about a year or so of college debt. And she wants to get rid of all the cost for a two-year or four-year college if it's a public school. How do you pay for things then? How do these colleges, and, and you have to ask this question. Okay, so it's now free. College is free. Are the professors working for free? And I know professors are, many of the professors are very, very liberal and believe in socialism. Fantastic. Who's paying them? Where does that money come from? Because they're not doing it for free. We know that Elizabeth Warren, as an example, gets about $300,000 to teach a class. Where is that $300,000 for Elizabeth Warren's class coming from? You know, did anyone ask that question? Because they should. And they should ask that question a lot because it's very important. Where is that money coming from? It comes from the public. Now, she likes to say... And in that article, which is, uh, and the article is Warren proposes $640 billion student debt cancellation from Politico on April 23rd, in case you want to look it up. Uh, but she says in there that the money's going to come from the rich. She's going to have new taxes for the rich and higher education, uh, I'm quoting her here, higher education opened a million doors for me. That's what she says. It's how a daughter of a janitor in a small town in Oklahoma got to become a teacher, a law school professor, a U.S. senator, and eventually a candidate for president of the United States. You know what she leaves out of this? She got all of that because she lied. Elizabeth Warren didn't become, get to be all of those things because she went to school. She went to school and lied and said that she was a Native American Indian took advantage of minority status and the benefits that Democrats enforce, and that got her her job, that got her through college, and got her uh, reduced rates. So she's playing on an uneven field, and she's lying to people because that's not how she got there. She got there because she lied for decades and took advantage of it and hasn't paid back any of this, she's a millionaire. She hasn't paid back anything. So there's one problem with some of the Democrats, and I want to get into another one. Um, and it's really important because uh, I think it's just as interesting. Oh, where is it here? Here it is. It's Cory Booker. Now, his big thing, and he's trying to steal some of the wind uh, from Joe Biden today, he's gonna, he promises he's going to have a woman as a rummaging maid. That's his big thing. If I get to get the nomination for Democratic Party, Cory Booker is looking to have a woman run. 
And that's all well, fine, and good, except why? Does that mean, why must it be a woman? Are there no one, is there no one else who is qualified? Is there no one else who's more qualified? What woman? What qualifications? Gender is not a qualification. Now, I understand, Cory Booker is way down on the list, no one's paying attention to him, but isn't that something we should ask? Why must it be a woman? What if there's a male that's more qualified? Maybe someone transgender, maybe someone gay. Why does it have to be a woman? Does it have to be a woman of color? Is, why is the gender the thing that's important? Why not say the most qualified person? Why not have your running mate be the person who could run America if something were to happen to you? Isn't that what it's supposed to be? And I'm not, I have nothing against women. I, I don't care. I've, I've said before, I believe the Democratic Party is going to nominate one of three women. And they're going to have him from president and vice president. It's going to be an all-woman ticket. I stand by that. I still believe that. I said that in October of 2018. I continue to say that. And I continue to say it's going to either be Kirsten Gillibrand, Kamala Harris, or Elizabeth Warren. Two of those three. I do not change my opinion because I have yet to see anything that would change it. But why must it be based on the gender or the color? Things that are intrinsic, that have nothing to do with the intelligence of the person, the qualifications, the skills, the experience, the abilities of those individuals. That's just whether or not they have a tan, whether or not they're born one way or another. And I'll get into that when we come back from the break a little bit more. But I think these are really important things to ask. Why is it that the Democratic Party is looking to buy people based on the things, the micro categories they separate people on. This isn't unifying the nation. They're not trying to bring people together. They're separating everyone. Oh, if you're a woman, I can pick you. If you happen to be a person of color, I can pick you. If you hit this correct box, this micro category, then you're worth something. Otherwise, you're not important. That's kind of scary. That's something we should really think about and really have a conversation about because it's dangerous. It is, it is the forerunner of some of the worst types of governments we have seen around the world. Evaluating people, and I say this all the time, but I'll say it again, evaluating people based on the fact that they have, they fit this box, whether you want to call it the master race or superiority or whatever, when you start identifying that certain people are better than other people, then we have a problem. When we stop thinking about what are the consequences of actions, we have a problem. When you start ignoring the economics and just saying, and, and promising the sky, as we've seen with the Obama stimulus, which did not fix the recession, and in fact extended it. When we see cash for clunkers, which made, <laughs> which hurt the U.S. economy, when we see Obamacare and you don't get to keep your doctors, when we get to see uh, the red flag and gun control, 22,000 gun control laws, we see it doesn't make people safer. We get lots of promises from a lot of politicians, especially Democrats, and it never works. But you lose more and more freedom each and every time. You become more dependent on the government each and every time. You should be scared of that. I am. But what we'll do right now is we'll take a quick break and then I'll come back and we'll talk about uh, a couple of other very interesting aspects of what we're going to see coming up uh, very shortly. So with that, we'll be right back.
Hello, everyone, and thank you for being back with me here at the No Sound Bites Allowed podcast. I am your host, Michael Voss, the Dragon of the Southern Tier, and I am happy to be here with you on this program, as always, because you are a great audience. Whether you're seeing it live, whether you come back to me on YouTube or Facebook or social media, Twitter, whatever it may be, I always am happy to be here with you and speaking with you and hearing from you, and I hope that you're all going to be here this weekend uh, in the Binghamton area at Binghamton University when we have the Liberty Weekend on April 27th and April 28th. On the 27th, you'll be able to hear from Larry Sharp of the Libertarian Party, a 2018 governor can- gubernatorial candidate for New York State. you are hear from my friend Dr. Giovanni Scaringi, a great individual councilman in the Bitty, uh, city of Binghamton uh, Council and I think you'll have a great time speaking with him. 
And of course, you can come on Sunday, April 28th, and speak with me. I will be giving a speech at 2 p.m., and then I'll be following that up with a question and answer period. I'm looking forward to hearing. That's the best part of it. I want to hear what you have to say, because quite honestly, you guys have some of the best questions I ever receive. And I thank you for that. I thank each and every one of you. In addition, I want you to check out my friends over at the Belmar Pub and at the Park Diner. They are friends of mine. That is not a paid advertisement. They are my friends, and I enjoy their establishments, and I think you will too. Please do check them out if you're in the area. So we're talking about the breaking news that's been going on, and there's a lot of breaking news. News flash. News flash. I love my sound effects. So, yeah, let's go straight to, you know, Joe Biden, the former vice president under Obama, decided that he wants to ask President Obama for an endorsement. No, that's not what he actually said. What he actually said is, and this is being quoted by the Free Beacon, it came out today, uh, about 11.22 a.m., about two hours ago, he mentioned that he asked President Obama not to endorse him, that he wanted to make sure that the election was fair and that everyone had an equal chance. And if you believe that, pigs fly. The moon is made of green cheese. Let's be honest. That is not true. That is not true. There is no candidate running for any election that is going to deny a high-profile endorsement. None. No one ever has run for anything, including Joe Biden, in his many years in office, elected office, has never said, don't endorse me. I mean, unless you're talking about David Duke, and by the way, many Democrats did go for his endorsement, as well as many other members of the KKK, um, including Senator Byrd, as I recall, when he's, uh, he was a Democrat, they loved his endorsement. But other than maybe the KKK, I can't imagine them saying no. I mean, there are Democrats, Keith Ellison, Ilan Omar, uh, who have gone out there and they look for the Farrakhan uh, of the, uh, what's his name, Reverend Farrakhan, who's with the, uh, who's been endorsing many of the Democrats. They follow him. They ask for his endorsement. And you mean to tell me that the ever so beloved Barack Obama, one of the champions of the far left and the progressive movement and the Democrats, he's saying he doesn't want his endorsement. Are you kidding me? Of course he wants his endorsement. He didn't get it. That's a different statement. But he's saying that he asked him not to endorse him. No, 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 no. That's a way to cover it up. And the media is probably going to run with that and say, well, of course, you know, Joe Biden, what a fair and honest guy. It's honest Joe. You know, to get away from the idea that he's creepy Joe, who has been alleged to be inappropriate, not sexually inappropriate, not me too inappropriate, but inappropriate with many, many women throughout his many decades in elected office. And he doesn't want an endorsement from President Obama. Of course he does. Every one of the presidential candidates want that. Uh, this is a first I've ever seen in politics, and it is so absurd, it is insulting. It is insulting to the general public to say he didn't want an endorsement from one of the most high-profile individuals in American politics in the last 20 years. That's like saying you don't want Bill Clinton's endorsement. Democrats want that. Of course they do. And that's to bring in money, so he's lying. But he has other problems that are also going on. And again, this is breaking news. Out of the Daily Caller, the article is Justice Democrats promises to oppose Joe Biden's presidential bid. That also was about two hours ago that the news broke. And here's the thing. The Justice Democrats under Kevin Robillard put out a tweet that said, uh, the new Justice Dems say they'll oppose Joe Biden's presidential bid, at least in the primary. Uh, quote, while we're going to support the Democratic nominee, we can't let a so-called centrist like Joe Biden divide the Democratic Party and turn it into the party of, quote, uh, no, we can't, end quote. This is what the Democrats are saying. The Democrats are killing each other. 
because Joe Biden is not progressive enough for the Justice Democrats. By the way, if you're wondering who are the Justice Democrats, they are the socialists. They are the Democratic Socialists. They are Bernie Sanders and Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez. In particular, the Justice Democrats are were, were run by Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and her campaign manager, and uh, which has its own issues. In fact, they have uh, an issue pending with the SE, excuse me, FCC, FEC, excuse me, FEC, for campaign violations, uh, paying her boyfriend through campaign funds. There's a lot of issues with the Justice Democrats, but if you want to know who they are, they are Alexandra Ocasio Cortez. They are the fringe of the far left. They are the furthest left of the Democratic Party. They're Bernie Sanders. They're they're socialists, and socialists are saying that. Joe Biden is far too centrist for their taste and that they oppose the centrist point of view that everyone needs to be. Basically, they're looking for everyone to be more of a socialist. They want socialism in America. I would be concerned if I was a rank and file Democrat hearing that and saying being centrist, being middle of the road, being willing to compromise, that's out the window. No, no. What Democrats want now is to have Post, post-birth post abortions. They want to have uh, no guns in America. They want everyone to make the same amount of money. Everyone needs to be in a union. There are no businesses. They want socialism. This is what they're asking for. This is what they're saying. And it's reinforcing a thought that we've heard before because just four days ago, <coughs> excuse me, just four days ago, it was the New York Times that was telling us and asking the question, should a white man be the face of the Democratic Party in 2020? Really? That's their big question. And they were asking it about Bernie Sanders, but guess what? The old white men are in the Democratic Party. That's Joe Biden. That's Bernie Sanders. And white men in particular, Beta O'Rourke, who is really, his real name is Robert O'Rourke. These are the men who lead in the Democratic Party. And I'm not just saying it for me. Go and check out the various polls out there. Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, Pete Buttigieg, um, and Beto O'Rourke. There's your top leaders right now, and they bounce around a little bit. Then it's followed by Kamala Harris, Elizabeth Warren, and Cory Booker, and Andrew Yang, of course. Uh, But you have to ask the question, is that really really accurate? Is is that what rank-and-file Democrats believe? That white men are so evil, even in the Democratic Party, that they can't be supported? That being a centrist, which Joe Biden is no centrist. He is no centrist. Remember, he, he's the one who opposed 32. Uh, he helped create 32 Obama-era executive orders to get rid of the Second Amendment. Joe Biden's the guy who uh, Democrats lauded for so many years, even as he made every gaffe talking about every race out there and insulting everyone. He's the creepy Joe. I don't know. This is amazing to me. It's amazing to me. Democrats can't... This is why I say it's going to be an all-woman ticket. Because men have been denounced by the Democratic Party. That's why Beto O'Rourke has to apologize for being white. Why Joe Biden apologized for being white and being rich. Why Bernie Sanders is giving every excuse in the world for being a millionaire and not making donations and having three houses. Because the mainstream, the message that has been pumped out for decades now is to say that these anyone who has that much wealth, anyone who is that old, anyone who has been part of politics that long, they must be evil. Well, guess what? This is the Democrats who are falling into this trap. That's what they are. And they hate their own people. And think about that. If Democrats, if the Justice Democrats, the Democratic Socialists, the Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Elon Omars of the world, if they can't stand their own party leaders, that would be Nancy Pelosi, Joe Biden, Bernie Sanders, if they can't stand them, and those individuals aren't good enough to equal the qualifications the Democrats demand everyone must fall under, 
how are you going to do? How would you, Joe Average, who has none of the wealth, none of the political power, none of the influence, how would they treat you? That's a really good question that really needs to be asked. If they think that being a centrist is a bad thing and is unworthy of the Democratic Party nomination, what do they think of the rank-and-file Democrats? I mean, has anyone really stopped to ask that question? And remember, Joe has a bunch of issues, not only because he's rank-and-file, not only because he's just a a regular Democrat, an old-fashioned Democrat. Remember that Joe Biden also doesn't like sanctuary cities. This was from back in 2015, I know. In in political circles, that's ancient. And this comes from the Washington Examiner. And the article's titled, When Clinton, Obama, and Biden Debated Sanctuary Cities. And it's going to come back to bite um, Biden because it was debate. There was a debate on September 26th of 2007 at Dartmouth College in New Hampshire. And at the time, Biden was running for uh, president on the Democratic ticket. And he was asked if he would allow cities to ignore federal law to be sanctuary cities. And his answer, once pressed on it, he tried to avoid answering it. Um, Clinton avoided the question. President, uh, excuse me, then Senator Obama avoided the question. But Joe Biden answered the question with no. No. He would not ignore it. He would not allow cities to ignore federal law and be sanctuary cities. Wow. Well, that explains why the Justice Democrats are against him. He doesn't support the illegal aliens that have entered our nation. He doesn't support picking and choosing which laws to follow on any given day. An absolute tenant and an absolute mandatory requirement of Democrats from the far fringe. This is something that political leaders of tomorrow, um, Citizen Action and Antifa, this is what they support. The far left fringe ideas that you can pick and choose which laws you want to follow. And if you happen to be a person of color, if you happen to be a woman, if you happen to be transgendered or gay, well, then you can just ignore certain laws altogether. That's the policies the Democrats are putting out there. And to sweeten the deal, Democrats are offering to give you free stuff. Elizabeth Warren's going to give you free college. Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is going to give you free energy. And you're going to get a free job. And you're going to get a free pay. Andrew Yang. You're going to get free money. None of this is free. And you never get what they offer. Red flags, red flag laws and gun control, 22,000 gun control laws have not made anyone safer. It has not stopped criminals or the deranged. We see this over and over again. You don't get better health care because you've got Obamacare. The majority of America did not help. You had higher deductibles that you can't afford. You got to lose your doctor and the health care that you did like. And now they want to go to single payer, which would eliminate all health care programs. You don't get to have private insurance. You get to have the same insurance as everyone else. Which, you know, ask, your, ask the average veteran at the VA how well that's working for them. Did we forget that under Joe Biden and under President Obama, we had two VA scandals where veterans were dying because they couldn't get to see a doctor. And this is what the Democrats are telling you you should have. The ability to have the same coverage as veterans where they died waiting for coverage. How well will that work for America? These are questions that really need to be asked of all of these Democratic candidates. We're not hearing these questions. We're not hearing the media ask these things, which are important and essential. You know, you want to run America. Do you believe in sanctuary cities? We need to ask Joe Biden that question again. Do you support sanctuary cities? In 2007, he said no. Here it is, 2019, he wants to run for president. Are you now taking the side of illegal aliens over American citizens and the law of the land and allow cities and counties and states 
to ignore the law and do whatever they want. Does Joe, Boy, does Joe Biden believe that? Does Joe Biden believe that every white person in America, male or female, should ap apologize for their race? Should straight individuals apologize for their sexual preference? Where does the line end? Who gets to choose what is important and what is something you should apologize for and something you should not? We should ask these questions. Who's going to pay for this free college, which isn't really free? Who's going to pay for the single-payer health care? These are really important questions. Why is no one asking these things? Why is the mainstream media selling the idea that you're going to get free stuff? It's all going to be free, and it'll be better. And yet not ask the questions, what are the consequences of this? How does this get done? Who gets to decide who are the people who are preferred? Why are we supporting segregation? Because that's what this is. If you are preferring uh, people who are not white over people who are white, or with Cory Booker, you're preferring women and a gender over other genders, that's segregation. That's discrimination. By definition, it is discrimination. Cory Booker eliminated all men, possibly all transgendered, everyone who is gay, because only women can be his vice president. Why? Please explain to me why it must be a woman and no other person is qualified enough in the entirety of the United States. I, I'm not saying that it can't be a woman, but why would you eliminate that pool of people? Why? Why aren't we asking uh, Elizabeth Warren, you know, how are you making these decisions? What's the economic impact of all of this? Why aren't we asking Joe Biden some very serious questions? Serious questions about where he plans to take this nation. What does he really believe? Does he follow the rest of the trend and say that America has to become a socialist nation? Because I, I think these are important. And I have to say, this is why I think if it continues down this path, I think the Democrats absolutely lose, which I'm not sad about at all. I'm happy. And I want them to continue down this path because I think most of America would agree with me. These are bad ideas. They have no idea what they're doing and no idea the consequences of their actions. And they want to take away our freedoms, not add to them. They don't want you to be more free. They want you to be more subservient. They want you to fall in line with what they think is best for you because government knows better than you do. And that's what they always offer, more government. More government means you're better. And I'm sorry, that has never been proven to be true. More government has never made anything better. Government doesn't make life better. Government makes problems. Now, I'm going to be talking about this and a lot of other things this weekend at the Liberty Weekend. Uh, I will be there on the 27th. I will be doing an interview with Larry Sharp, who will be speaking at the event at 1 o'clock on the 27th. At 3.30, I'll be doing an interview with Larry Sharp. Uh, on the 28th at 2 p.m., I will be giving a speech which will cover red flags, the Constitution, the consequences of some of the things that are being proposed and enforced, enforced down our throats. And I'm also going to be taking questions from you. And I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say and what you think and your questions on anything that I've covered over the last 12 years. And this is being brought to you by the Binghamton University College of Libertarians and the College uh, Binghamton University College Republicans jointly. And so this should be a great event. And I really hope people come to see this because this is an opportunity to learn about different points of view. I know a lot of college students, a lot of people who just look at headlines and the social media and the memes, you don't get to hear the other side. You don't get to hear other people's ideas. You don't get to see what really is going on. Get a full idea. You don't have to agree with me. That's not the point of the event. We're not here to change your minds. 
And that's why I'm so happy I was invited to this event that includes libertarians and conservatives and Republicans and everyone else. And I hope the media comes down, as I've invited them, to hear what all the different sides have to say. Because it's not about what one person thinks. It's about all of us working together, about hearing all of the different ideas and working with the best parts of all of it. It's not like Cory Booker saying, well, only these people have the right idea. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. Or saying that, or the Democratic Party saying only certain types of people are worthwhile. That we should only have certain categories of people. And everyone else should apologize for being born and being who they are. I'm sorry, I don't agree with that. We are all worthwhile. We all benefit and give something. We need to have all ideas. And that's why I'm glad about this Liberty Weekend and why I'm looking forward to it so much. And I hope that you're going to be there with us. Uh, but remember that every Tuesday, and I know now I'm getting all the, all the messages and texts now are coming through, but uh, I do always value hearing from you. Remember the show is on every Tuesday, every Thursday at 1 p.m. Saturdays from 12 noon until 2 o'clock. And this weekend will be over at the Liberty Weekend Please, if you see me, stop me, ask me questions. I'm always happy to take your questions. I'm always happy to speak with you all. And uh, if you get an opportunity, do check out the interview with the B Binghamton University Pipe Dream. And uh, I look forward to hearing from everybody. Looking forward to seeing you this weekend. I'll talk to you again very, very soon. Thank you, folks.